So, without worrying about the slides, one of the big things we've actually had over the past 15 years, we've had a large amount of experience with Lustre and various platforms. And our biggest gain over the past eight or nine years, really, with dealing with DDN, has been how easy it's been to engage with research development and the development structure, both of genomics research, the challenges we're facing, and how we can address those as part of the development of the next platform and the features that we need to, uh, to recognize from there. So the project work that we'll be showing you in a minute actually took place between the team that I run. We look after high performance computing system, we look after cloud informatics, we look after uh, large data repositories. And we had a number of buffers on the way, and these guys have actually worked with us very closely in order to try and overcome those particular issues. Everything's smooth in IT, isn't it? <laughs> so, within our infrastructure, Sanger itself, if you want to know anything about Sanger, great website, www.sanger.ac.uk. This is what happens if you put a speaker in front of people in their slides. They'll, they'll tell you about their marketing. The history has been fantastic. It was founded in 93 and originally it was part of the Human Genome Project. And the idea was, well, actually, you know what? We're going to come up with a draft of the human genome. We're going to map the human genome, three billion base pairs. How hard can it be? Turns out quite hard. Worldwide collaboration took 10 years. Multinational. And after that 10 years of work, 10 million pounds, they came up with a draft of the first human genome. And the Sanger Institute, great place to work. I'm not just saying that because I have to. These are the guys that they decided very early on they were going to release the data they sequenced immediately. This is why your genes are not all painted. This sounds like an odd thing, right? But what it means is it lowers the barrier to entry for research. Any university or academic environment, any farmer, anyone can access that data today without paying a fee for the research on it as a result of that release of the data back then. So, it really is a fantastic place to work, and that openness goes through everything that we do on the IT, on the research, and the science. And it's actually helping to drive today the, the healthcare genomics that you're seeing. That large burst you're seeing now, people talk about personalised medicine, comes from these decisions. So, when I say I'm really quite proud to work with something, there's a reason for it. So, over the years, we've had a number of research projects. There's no longer just one human genome draft out there. We've seen projects like the 100,000 Genomes, 10,000 Genomes Project, UK10K. These are global projects now. It's no longer just something that one person can do in a large infrastructure site. Sequencing itself has become democratised. The amount of sequence coming off the sequences now outstrips Boyle's Law. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. The data that's coming off these is enormous. So we've come from 10 years to the draft of one human genome to today we can get multiple genomes equivalent of a single sequencing unit over a two to three day period. What's coming next is scary. We are told, as I mentioned earlier, that the next generation of sequences are going to be able to produce the equivalent turnaround in 50 minutes. 50 minutes. That is astonishing. How much data would that break out then every 15 minutes? How big is that? So we're talking terabytes of data in that, that, that kind of turnaround time. So how do we manage this? What do we do with this? And what does it mean for us in the long term? So back the envelope calculation. Yeah. And it's predictive because you can't buy the hardware yet. But if you talk about roughly two petabytes of data per machine per year, and if you consider that Sanger doesn't buy one sequencer, it tends to buy them in quite large units. Let's just say 10. Yeah. That's say 20 to begin a year. If we then say, well, actually, you know what? The downstream analysis is normally an expansion of about 3 to 1 to 4 to 1 for the groups that have got it pretty well nailed. They're getting on for 100 petabytes a year, I've got to manage. That can't happen. And that's why we mentioned with the AI part earlier. We're going to have to stream this stuff and choose what we keep, yeah. what's the definition of done, what's good enough, who are we doing it for, what's the value of the data. And if it takes only 15 minutes to analyze again, well, you know what? Is it cheap to just put it through again when you need it and do something else? Although there are high value sets. Not every patient has a good prognosis. Not all data remains available. Sometimes patients can rescind their permission to use that data. Mm -hmm. And that also comes in line with things like GDPR, how long can you keep data, how, how identifiable is it, what you can do with it downstream. Yeah. All kind of kicks in with this broader spectrum of genomics research. And this kind of leads into where we're going here today. Um, so for the past 15 years, Sanger's had an HPC environment. It's needed to. It needs to take the ATCG, the basis of the human genome, 
and say how sure we are that A is an A, T is a T, and C is a C, and so on. This is not a small task. Putting that data together in a way so that you can then compare and contrast different genomes. Patient A seems to have this condition, patient B seems to have this condition. What's the difference between them? That's not a small task either. So there's a large bank of compute for this. It's taken 15 years of HPC to get that stuff there. Yeah. As we're moving on, we're finding disruptive technologies. I've mentioned about the sequences coming along, but there's also the coding side. Does anybody use Docker? You'll be exposed to it. Yeah. Who's, who's met the challenge of Docker in a secure environment? Yay, hands up. So, Docker is a fantastic developer tool, fantastic developer tool. It allows your developers to very rapidly iterate over changes, to get things how they want them, and then to distribute it. The whole image can be described in a few lines of descriptive code. So people can pick this up worldwide, really, really small little file, little Docker file, hit the go button, and they've created the same instance environment that you had to begin with. It's astonishing. But for us, when they start it up, how do we know they're not root inside it? What happens if they were root inside it? What happens if dot, 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 someone deletes the wrong directory? There's all sorts of problems. And with GDPR kicking in, you've got to be able to say who's got access to what data, et cetera, et cetera. Entirely reasonable, but it does create a bit of a headache for a traditional HPC administrator who's got this wide open cluster to now suddenly having this, this thing in the middle, this, this entity that can cause grief. So how do we manage that? I think you're not a hospital, right? So it's not as if you've got patient data coming off. Or is it? How does it work? So, there are a number of projects where the data is actually able to relate, for example, certain diseases, say, in, in areas of the world where there's not high population density. And it comes with a GPS location. That's important for the spread of that infectious disease. You now can potentially identify who that person is. So this potentially identifiable with data is, is a real thing, it's a real issue. And we get the same thing, obviously, with rare diseases and rare conditions. If only 10 people globally right. with a particular condition, right. right, you've got a pretty good idea. So we're getting that stuff today. Collaboration with the hospitals is getting stronger. We're seeing more of a move in this directory. So yeah, yeah, this is going to be real for us. So how do we address that problem? How do we address security with HPC and data sets that may have personal identifiable information? And one of the processes we've taken is to bring cloud computing environment inside our world. Ah, fantastic. So on the left hand side we've got where we've been for the past 15 years, traditional HPC, large scale out, and we've had a large amount of Lustre for a long while. We started out pretty early on about, about 1.2 release of Lustre. Today we have about 15 petabytes on site. And that link between the compute and the traditional Lustre layout has been fantastic for getting through these work. But today, we need to deal with those, those, those private, that, that data security. We need to be able to segregate workflows and workloads that are often imported from others that we have no control over. So we move towards a cloud environment. We're calling it a flexible compute bit because the amount of flexibility we're providing our customers. But some catches. How do you go from HPC, where you've got your tied in Lustre, you've got everything there, you've got home directories, everything's easy, to this cloud environment where you bring up an image in a cloud, if you go to a uh, cloud provider, you bring a image. You don't expect to see your work home directory on it. You don't expect to see your Lustre directory on it. You don't expect to have any of these things. You expect to use an object store. And this is a high barrier to entry for our customers. How do they now migrate to this platform? They've got 20 years' worth of bioinformatics pipelines that are based on POSIX file system. Everything's designed for the HPC world. So we contacted DDN and thought, you know what? There's an opportunity here. How can we bring high-performance POSIX into OpenStack? in a way that supports the tenant segregation. So that group A cannot see group B's data whilst you're doing it either in flight or whatever you've left there, or whatever your, your data sets may be. And we started out with a relatively uh, older system as so we retired it and we bought in some new uh, DDN hardware to replace it. And we contacted the guys within James's team. We said, okay, there are a number of options out there so far today and most of them involve dealing with secure Linux dealing with Kerberos, dealing with all sorts of clever behind the scenes, and you watch the performance plummet. <coughs> it's a nightmare to manage, it's a nightmare to administer, it's hard to keep going. You've got a lot of training for your systems people, for your customers, it really isn't simple. So we started out with our cloud environment, and I got a little carried away here. I was told we can build a cloud environment. <laughs> said, That's great, have we got a budget? Yes, <laughs> this is wonderful. So we actually <coughs> built a thing around 100 gig networking internally. 
And the reason for this was not just getting carried away, we knew there was going to be a lot of backing communication, grab A and Q, um, dealing with volumes, cinder volumes, rebuilds of disks, the whole thing. So we built a pretty big infrastructure up, but we did so knowing that we could link an existing technology as well outside. And it was really designed with that from the outset, how can we build these things in and bring them together. So we started out with Lustre 2.9 because it brought in some new features, the ability to squash access for a particular group to a particular mount point. Really powerful. And the second part was to be able to collapse the users to a particular user space. Put those two things together, you can now say, only these people in your team can access this particular area. So we started out with our OpenStack world, and so we've got this tenant group of people, and we've got a tenant network, the usual sort of thing. If we create a provider network and put in a Lustre router, to send the traffic to our Lustre system. And if we were managed to squash those privileges down on the Lustre system, now we've got multi-tenant support. We don't use SE Linux, we haven't got any uh, on the flight encryption or encapsulation, so we don't get the performance here. So we started out looking at something called uh, a node map. Has anybody used Lustre before? Anybody used node map on Lustre before? It's pretty niche, isn't it? It's like yeah. one hand up. We started out with this to just try and collapse all the permissions down, to reduce the scape that people can access. And it wasn't too bad, that worked out pretty well. We set up a couple of directories, that was pretty simple, that worked pretty well. And again, no map again to actually collapse who's allowed access to that particular area. So we've now put the users in a pool who can access it. We've got a directory with a pool of users associated with it. We just now need to set the network up so it links to that part so nobody else can access it from one site. The next step is to then link it into OpenStack. OpenStack gives your customers lots of options. They can bring up an image here, they can put a network on, they can change the permissions they want to allow their people to use, and nobody else outside the tenant group can touch their instances. Sounds pretty good. That's what they want. We then have the joy of adding the provider network. And it's this bit that allows the traffic to go from their instance across our network to, in this case, the Lustre system they want to contact. All great, fine, fantastic. And we used to have to go through quite a step for this. But the OpenStack community is pretty vibrant, it's pretty dynamic. You can tell them there's a problem, they're pretty quick in getting back to you. So they've come back with something called role-based access controls. So now when I bring up a provider network, I can say, this group of people can touch this and that's all. Which means I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> and I don't have to do that anymore either, which is great. This is all really quick turnaround time, makes our life simpler. We put together some LNET routers. Anybody who's played with Lustre normally finds the LNET router sits on their device. It's pretty easy to put others in the system. You can add as many as you need, really. Put together a few virtual machines. We've got a virtualization infrastructure with about 6,000 cores. We can afford to put a few Lustre machines up in there. Yeah. Uh, we put two networks on each one. We gave it its own tenant network. They get that by default. We start using the system. And we created a provider network for them, just as we showed. Oh, it's a bit fuzzy. Must be mine, sorry. We found pretty early on that the actual file sets and the UID mapping wasn't really a problem. It didn't really hit the performance when we started these things going. That worked out pretty well. That's pretty good. That's all right. Things are working. We can access our files. That was the first success. And we found the size of the instances accessing the data didn't really have a big issue. So the actual Lustre client seemed pretty well behaved. It seemed to come together quite nicely. Same thing with client rights, it wasn't too bad. It was, these are single client rights. We didn't expect Lustre to fly that fast because you get the aggregate performance from the, the increased number of hosts. The more threads, the better throughput you normally get. And as you increase the block size again, you tend to get better performance as it aligns to the Lustre components. Increase the number of Lustre clients. This is going pretty well. This is an old piece of hardware. We've retired it. This is more than 50% of the actual theoretical performance out of the system from virtualized hosts. That was going pretty well, we're pretty happy with that. When we tried something similar with the SE Linux and the Kerberos based impact, we we're getting about 25% of the performance at best. <coughs> Again, same sort of thing as we aggregated the read performance of the metal and the routers, we found actually it still works pretty much on the part. It's going well, it's all looking good. It actually works, this looks viable. We can actually put this in production, we can give this to people to use. The green line, by the way, is a bit of an outlier. We're not sure why that particular one suddenly went surprisingly well. I suspect there's a caching issue behind the, the scenes. 
Um, I've left it completely to remind you that uh, benchmarking is hard. And cash, cash currency, that's even better. Okay, fine, so we could do this for hardware on that routers, but you know what, we're an open spec. Why would I want to do things in hardware if I can avoid it? If I could just go click, go, bring up a luster router for someone, <coughs> life's easy. I can have a single image, I can go one for you, one for you, three for you, two for you, or they can bring them up for themselves. So we'll give it a go. It improves the amount of isolation for their tenant group. There's no physical hardware out there for anybody else to, to get involved with. It provides more fault isolation. You can have multiple units up, so if one dies, you can carry on the others. And it's relatively cheap. It's only an instance. We gave it a go, the same sort of general topology. On their provider network, they bring up the LNet router. Life is simple. They say it should improve security because, of course, there's nothing on the outside that can touch that box either now. It's all inside their environment, it's all inside their OpenStack tenant group. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite so simple. We discovered we hit a bug in OpenStack, or well, we consider it a bug. OpenStack provides you lots of security, it gives you the ability as a customer to create your own security groups, your own security policies, but it also has a set of defaults. And there's a race condition in the way it applies to these before liberty. Um, the good news is this has been fixed and we can ignore this now. So this is no longer a problem if you're going to give this a go. Again, the Luster routers, no problem at all. It just worked. It just worked. There was no special source or magic required apart from the Luster client and set up. That's it. Again, the reads and the writes were all pretty good. They are all pretty performant. So again, this suggests that for us as a basically high throughput compute environment rather than high performance compute, it's all about the data. This is key to it actually being useful. We did have some surprises. We discovered on one of them that we could get some asymmetric routing going on. That was all right. Turned out it was actually not too much of a problem at all. We were a bit nervous to begin with. But because everything was tied down to the provider network, it was tied down to the users, it was tied down to the tenant group, there was no leakage of the data. So it actually worked out okay. So we shall Conclusions, and you know what? This actually works. So it was a really good collaboration with DDM on this. It actually worked really well. It was a lot of two and fro Sebastian in particular. And it was fantastic. So we're actually able to deploy this to our customers. We have a couple of groups now using this in anger. They're, they're hammering it. They're getting some good use out of this. And today is the only effective high performance file system that we're able to deploy within our OpenStack world. That's great. But this is actually the start of the journey for us. This looks great, we've provided these guys a stepping stone, we've made it possible for them to run their traditional HPC applications within their instances and go for a distributed model in the future. So it's a transition part, but also, as you've heard with the AI, with the GPUs and everything else coming to these, and the way OpenStack community is working at the moment, we are seeing these tools being used for deploying future clusters. We can use it to deploy potentially edge units edge devices with an OpenStack. We can provide whoever we need access to these systems and these devices through software-defined delivery. Our customers no longer want to know all this clever stuff I've showed you in the client slides. That's the last thing they want to see. They just want to see, I've pressed a button, my instance came up, and this one's got luster on it. They don't care about the magic. Or as a friend put it, they just want to know what the time is. They don't want to know how the watch was made. They just want to know what's going on, right? So we've got to make this simpler. So the next steps, our future steps. How do we integrate this more into OpenStack? There are projects in OpenStack, like Manila, that allow you to have things such as NFS servers. Press a button, I've got an NFS server, it manages it all for you. Clearly there's a route here for Luster. Clearly there's a route here for Luster. Click, I've got my Luster file system. It connects to my external resources. Everything's there, fantastic. Neutron port security is dramatically improved. That's looking a lot better in future releases, so that's already going the right direction. There's improved network performance, particularly the MTUs on the, uh, the opens of these switches. They exist on every one of the host machines that provide the compute. But generally, the community is going well. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to every of DDM, in particular Sebastian and James, who helped coordinate things on the R&D side of DDM. Um, our team, who are again looking rather fuzzy, that, that was obviously taking a good day. Um, James Beale in particular was, was key on this. And our customers have been feeding back that the work is actually proving practical benefit to them today.
So, thank you. Thank you.